Genesis 31. It's been said the trouble with good advice is it usually interferes with your plans. <laughs> Have you found that to be true? Remember when you had something in your mind that you were set to do when you were a kid and your parents came and said, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. You're like, it is. You're like, no, it isn't. And does father know best? Does mother know best? That's the question when you were a kid. And, and when you are a little kid, it was the red hot stove that glowed and looked so pretty. And your mother said, no. And as you reached out your little hand, whack, Ooh, what was that? But I want to touch it. And so if you were to follow through with that venture that your mother said no, uh, and you touched that beautiful red hot stove that could be nothing but beauty and warmth, when you touched it, pss, man, your hand got fried, blisters, pain, suffering, and I was, oh man, I should have listened to mom. But by the time you're in junior high, your parents are lame, and you know a lot more than they do. Remember those days when, oh man, mom and dad, what do they know? And, and, and it's funny because they're old enough to see, mom and dad, your lameness, but they're still not old enough to know that you still know more than they do, like 10,000 times more than they do. And uh, the problem with that is some of you never really grow out of junior highness. <laughs> you become eternal junior hires. Oh, I know more than you know. And so it gets down to teenage years and the girl that brings home the, the boy and the dad sees him like, really, this is it? <laughs> it's like, whoa, this is the guy. Oh, but I love him. But I love him. Even though uh, he, uh, he's riding a BMX bike and uh, <laughs> you want to get married and he's got, you know, he's got a, a, a job where he passes out bags around schools that sells people things when bags. Uh, what's, what, what's that kid doing? And you want to marry, what? but I love him. But he doesn't have a job, but I love him. And you're like, oh, man. And if your daughter could only know, that's going to be a, not a very good path to take. But father, well, does he know best? That's the question you ask yourself. And are you good at taking good advice? Now, in our story, if you found uh, yourself going through the Bible with us, uh, the last several weeks, we found just how dysfunctional, how crazy a family can be. Would you agree? Esau, Jacob, Rebecca and Isaac and Rachel and Leah and all these people, these characters in the story, in the Bible story. It's funny how people that say, oh, if you read the Bible, it's this old book, it's unrelatable, ancient people that were like Australopithecus man and uh, they didn't know anything about our problems today. Really? Have you really read the same Bible that I'm reading? Because these people are very much like sometimes the people I counsel during the week. And I find myself in this story, just the, the, the trickery and the, the sinfulness. That's just humanity. We're just a messed up bunch of people. I love it how God chooses people that are foolish and weak, sinful and wacko. And the Lord says, oh, I can bless that. I can still work with them. And I'm going to do great and mighty things through those people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you'd think if it was, you know, a story that was supposed to be perfect and holy, You'd think God would choose perfect and holy people. The problem, there are no perfect and holy people, save one, Jesus Christ, who lived on this earth and was truly perfect and holy. And so what do we do? We, we realize that God is going to make a mighty nation, and of that nation, there's going to be a lineage of people that will come through the ages where the Messiah, Jesus, would come through that line of people. And so who does he choose? He chooses, well, Abraham, who then has Isaac, and then Isaac has Jacob. And, and Jacob will have his sons. Uh, and that's where we were on Wednesday night. How did that happen? Well, it's funny. You got to remember Jacob and Esau. Jacob tricked uh, Esau out of his blessing, as we saw last Sunday. He, uh, he bought with a bowl of soup uh, the birthright of Esau. Esau, man, he was a carnal dude. He was messed up. He was part of that dysfunctional family. Because, you know, he, he was one of those kids that th didn't listen to his dad. Remember his dad said, I want you guys to marry someone that's not of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Flashlights. Uh, I don't want you to marry any of those people. He says, but I want you to marry someone of our, of our people, of our group, because they will not pull you away from the Lord to worship other idols. That was kind of the idea. Keep them separate. But as soon as Esau is that kid, remember, remember you told a kid, there's certain kids, now don't tear the wall, the clock off the wall. They're looking at you like this. Don't do that. Let's see what you're going to do about it. Do you remember those kids? Didn't any of you have those kids? 
So, so what happens? Isaac says, do not marry a Canaanite or a Hittite or a Hivite or a Jebusite or a flashlight. Don't marry these people. And so what does Esau do? He goes and finds a couple Hittite hotties and he marries them. And it grieves Isaac and Rebecca, man. It just breaks their hearts. And so what does he do after that? Then he goes and finds Ishmael, the, the family of Ishmael. Now, was there bad blood between Isaac and Ishmael? And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, isn't that something? Esau goes to Ishmaelites and says, okay, I'm gonna marry a couple more. So now he's got like four wives of people really that made the, the mom and dad real sad. By the way, the Proverbs tells us that the wise son maketh his mother glad. Uh, that's something to think about, you young men. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> Some guys by experience back there, like, tell you what. <laughs> that's good, I like that. Now, now, here's the thing. Esau's dysfunctional, Jacob's dysfunctional, and Jacob, you know, and, and he's trying to do all the right thing. We saw on Wednesday night how he, you know, he, Jacob's this smooth kind of uh, man that's very soft and, and likes to, you know, cook in the tent uh, with the ladies where Esau's the man's man and he's a hunter and all that. And, and then we saw Jacob kind of come out of his, uh, his thing and he starts being kind of a man. He starts telling some guys what to do and he lifts a stone off of a big well, da, 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 and then he sees his, his girl, Rachel. Oh man, she's beautiful. He, he loves her. And so he walks up to her and he gives her a big kiss. And we're like, oh yeah, Jacob, what a man. And then he weeps really profusely. We're like, oh man, that's, he lost it. But anyway, he was close. Anyway. So Rachel, uh, he loved her, worked seven years for Uncle Laban. Remember Uncle Rico? That's kind of what you picture in your mind there. Uh, that's Uncle Laban, a trickster, a sinner, a weirdo. That's Uncle Laban. And so Jacob works seven years, but Laban tricks him into marrying Ray, uh, Leah, the older sister, heavily veiled. He says, I do. They go to bed. Next morning they wake up and there's Jacob laying next to ah, Leah. The Bible says, when you looked at Leah, it made your eyes hurt. <laughs> Poor Leah. <clears throat> so then he works seven more years and ended up marrying Rachel. 14 years working for two brides. Craziness, man, but it gets worse. Because in Bible times, having babies for the woman, that was kind of like your prowess. That was sort of, if you, if you could crank out the babies, man, that was, that was your goal in life in those days. And so problem, Rachel. She couldn't have babies, she was barren. Leah, she was a baby factory. Man, she starts cranking out the kids and, and Rachel's bummed and jealous. And, and uh, we know that Jacob loved Rachel, was tricked into marrying Leah, but Leah was the one who was cranking out the kids. That was kind of a good thing for her. It was this baby competition. And because Rachel couldn't have babies, she said, okay, I tell you what, I want you to take my handmaid, Billa, and sleep with her. And then you, she, you can have babies through her for me. So, so Billa, the handmaid, starts cranking out babies. Well, Leah says, well, two can play at that game. And so she brings out Zilpa, her handmaid, and says, sleep with her. So Jacob's like, cool. And he goes and sleeps with her. <laughs> man, dysfunction right here, man. This is horrible. So Jacob's sleeping with Rachel and Leah and Billa and Zilpa, and there's babies flying out everywhere. <laughs> and guess what? You're like, man, that's horrible. Yeah, those are the 12 tribes of Israel. That makes a mighty nation. That's what God says. Okay, I'm going to use those people. In fact, those 12 sons that would ultimately come, and by the way, the Lord would see Rachel's affliction and that she was barren. He says, okay, I'm going to open up her womb, as, as the Bible says. And, and so she gives birth to Joseph, <clears throat> which is interesting. Not only all that, but we see parents playing favorites with their kids and all kinds of dysfunction. Listen, here's the thing that I want to remind you as we kind of reflect on this is, um, one, one person might say, well, I can't believe this. Some people are even critical of the Bible because they say, ha, look at these people, they're just a total mess. And they say, what does God think he's doing? Well, I think it's one of the most amazing things in the world. What this demonstrates to you and me is there's hope for us. This shows us that if God can work with these people, maybe there's hope for us. And because of God, now listen, his graciousness, because God is gracious and kind-hearted and forgiving and patient and merciful. In fact, it says his mercy endures how long? Forever. So here's this wacko family. The Lord says, okay, I'm gonna bless those guys in spite of who they are. 
They don't deserve anything. They haven't earned anything good. They've messed up most of the things, but I'm still gonna bless them. That's why we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, but was blind, and now I see. We're gonna see the Lord take this mess of a family, and we're gonna see some good things come out. Not for a while, but we have a tiny, tiny hint of something good, so I'm gonna grab onto it for our text today, because it's hard to find good things in this story to be happy about. Uh, So I found one. and uh, we're going to make that the topic. See, if you're joining us, we, we go through this verse by verse, chapter by chapter on Wednesday night, chapter 31, 32, maybe 33 on Wednesday. But today I want to show you one little verse. You might say, whoopie doo, big deal, but it's big to me because there's one glimmer of hope and it comes out of the mouths of these two women who are having this baby competition. Now, one other thing, Uncle Laban has ripped off Jacob. He ripped him off. He tricked him in the bride thing, but he also, we're going to find Wednesday night, he tricked him out of a bunch of flocks and herds and ripped him off and ripped off Leah and Rachel of their inheritance that would be proper from Uncle Laban, their father. And so uh, Laban has been really a trickster. Uh, It's funny how whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Jacob was also a trickster. Remember he tricked Esau? Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And now Jacob's reaping a harvest that's not so good. Be sure of this, the Bible says, your sin will find you out. And that's true with Jacob here. So Laban's ripped him him off, ripped off Leah and Rachel. And they're a little bit bitter now. A woman scorned. So what happens? Well, let's pick it up. Genesis chapter 31, right here in uh, verse 14. Now, by the way, this is... Jacob, just for context, he calls together a family meeting and says, man, what are we going to do? We've been ripped off. We've been treated poorly by Uncle Laban. What are we going to do? So it says there in verse 14, and Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Jacob, is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us and hath quite devoured also our money. For all the riches which God hath taken from our father that is, uh, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. There it is, the little smidgen of light in this sinister kind of crazy story. The girls say, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. I started out today, the trouble with good advice is that it usually interferes with your plans. But once in a while, Uh, your plans have gone so badly uh, that you end up uh, starting to say, well, maybe I should go back to plan plan A (laughs) and do the right thing. You know, in the the book of James, it's kind of interesting because um, so many people, you know, we we talk about this, but this is where it really gets tricky. In James chapter 1, it says in verse 21, wherefore lay apart all filthiness, and superfluity, uh, that means overindulgence, uh, naughtiness, and receive with meekness. That's, uh, you know, um, my, not my agenda pounding through, but submit, submitting to the power of God, meekness. Uh, it says, so receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. And then it says, and be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. What's that? One of the major themes of the Bible is just to do what God tells you to do. James nails it down even more, uh, perhaps close to home when he says, and be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. How do you deceive yourselves in being hearers only and not doers? I'll tell you, especially if you're like me, if you're an old time church attender, old time Christian, you know what I love about um, new Christians is they remind us old, crusty, wacko Christians that have been Christians a long time what it means to just be hungry for the word. They remind us what it means to be obedient. I love seeing new believers because they, they, uh, they read something in the Bible and say, man, we're supposed to be careful what we look at. We're like, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah, man, I, was, I used to go see these movies and now I, just, I'm, I saw what the Bible says. I will put no unclean thing before my eyes. And so I'm just not gonna go see those movies. And we're like, yeah, we used to feel that way too. <laughs> crusty Christians that become carnal and we come and, and then and here's what we do 
we as crusty Christians, we can sit around church and take notes and we play the game and say the right lingo and all, lingo and all that stuff. Church lingo is kind of a funny thing, isn't it? Uh, we can talk it. And, uh, and then the world comes in and says, what are you talking about? Um, all of the language that we use. But we say the right words and we're sitting there listening to the sermon and we're taking down the notes. And somehow in our mind, in our heart, because we've taken down the notes, we've done it. I wrote the notes, so that must mean I've got it conquered and taken care of in my life. And then we walk through the barn doors where there's these big magical erasers <laughs> going over your head and they just erase all the information and you walk out, ding, okay, I'm back to my carnal Christian self. Uh, That's the tendency of the old crusty Christian. I've heard this sermon. I know these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we go on and we become really good at hearing. In fact, uh, I'm concerned in a day where we have MP3s and radio programs and uh, you can online download any sermon, not only from today, but from yesteryear. You can listen to old C.S. Lewis uh, teachings that he gave, uh, audio files. I mean, it's amazing what what we have access to. And so with all the access to Bible teaching and sermons and radio programs, we become connoisseurs of biblical teaching. Well, I liked his points. I liked what he said, or "Mm, that one really didn't do it for me. It's like the wine connoisseur. You know, we're sitting there, you know, we take the sermon in, squish it around in our mouth, spit it out. Uh, You know, what are we doing? Become connoisseurs of biblical teaching. Or should we maybe check ourselves and say, Lord, would you... Peel back the calluses. Would you peel back the the toughness over my heart and say, Lord, would you freshen up the the hunger for your word and the hunger and thirst for righteousness? If you're an old crusty Christian, that's what you got to watch out for. Trust me, I know as a person who's been saved for 43 years. Um, Now all that to say, we have some advice that's good advice. The question is, will Jacob listen to it? It's not just here. In fact, it's interesting in the Bible, we have this this thing where the Lord gives a word for people to do things. We're gonna see kings come up in in, uh, the first and second kings that will actually uh, hear advice from old advisors and young advisors and the king will listen to the advice, but they'll take the horrible advice. In one case, the younger guys were giving him horrible advice and uh, the older guys were given a really good advice, but the young king took the young man's advice. See, the point is when it says, whatever God told you to do, do it. The problem today for you and for me is there's a lot of voices coming in. We have voices telling us what we should eat, what we should wear, what we should do. And and do we really know what we're talking about? What we should eat? You know, I've been around long enough to hear all kinds of amazing things that you should eat or you shouldn't eat, or then they change. Have you noticed how many things change? Eggs are a big one. Don't eat eggs, cholesterol. And then, oh, eggs are good protein. Don't eat eggs. Split the egg white from the egg yolk. Do this. Oh, but if you do that, it loses its chemical. Oh, and, and man, they just, what do you do? Do I eat eggs? <laughs> uh, my favorite one years ago, this was one that I really, it was a study that stuck in my head. The study came out and it said that cheeseburgers from McDonald's help prevent cam- cancer. <laughs> I was like, wow, amen to that one. And uh, I guess it was the mixture of the cheese and the beef and somehow in the way they cooked it, it was only McDonald's, not Burger King. (laughs) McDonald's hamburgers help prevent cancer. Now, I'm sure they cause other things, but uh, we got all kinds of advice from all kinds of places. And the question is, is it good advice? You see, the advice that Rachel and Leah give to Jacob, whatsoever the Lord has told you to do, do it. That's the best advice you'll ever hear. We live in a culture with all kinds of voices. If you're taking notes or if you want to think through this with me, I was kind of thinking about all the different places we get advice. And what causes me concern is how how many of these voices actually uh, people almost put up there with God. It's like God tells us what he wants us to do. Question, uh, I've I've had non-believing people, and when I'm talking to non-Christians, they've said, what are you Christians are always saying, God told me this or God told, how do you know what God wants or God says? And, and I think we've done a bad job explaining that we have the Bible. And we believe that this Bible that we have sitting in our laps right now or uh, with us, we believe that this is God's word. And we believe it's inspired and infallible. We believe that we know the heart of God 
because we have the word of God right here. And uh, that on another sermon or another time, I would spend time showing you why this really is the word of God. And it's really one of the most powerful, incredible books ever. And if you've missed that, or if you doubt that this is the word of God, we can, uh, after the service, direct you to some studies about this incredible, miraculous book and the proof that it really is word of God. But assuming whether or not you believe it or not, I don't know, but assuming that we as Christians believe it, when we say God said, and we know, well, hopefully the Christians are saying it because it's right here in the book. We can say God's heart on this matter is right here. Are you with me on that? That's an important thing to know. Um, It's not, I like to think God thinks of it this way. No, that's just whatever. Blow that off. Don't take anybody's advice on that. But if you can say, but the Bible says, then you can say, okay, this is God's word. That's important. The reason why is because there are those who say whatever on God's word, but instead of just saying, you know, uh, I am concerned about what people are saying, instead of saying whatever God says for you to do, do it. Number one, I've noticed that people say, whatever your doctor says unto you, do it. Whatever your doctor, yeah. I've noticed that in our culture, especially here in Portland, I think maybe, we got some pretty amazing medical facilities, praise the Lord. We got OHSU, Dorn Becker, Emmanuel, St. Vinny's. Man, we got all kinds of doctors and medical uh, you know, facilities and, and some real experts on certain things. You know, it's pretty amazing. We do live in a, a pretty uh, great place for that. And by the way, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna say, some people might misconstrue as me being anti-medicine, anti-doctor, which I am not. Thankful for medicine, thankful for doctors. But let me just remind you, they are not God. I've met some surgeons that think they're God, but they are not. Uh, And when they say that they are practicing medicine, I have found that to be very much true. I was mentioning on Wednesday night uh, how many couples that I talk to. It's actually kind of amazing how many couples I talk to who have been told by the uh, ultrasound technicians or these uh, um, tests, prenatal tests or whatever that they do, um, because of the measurements of the baby's head are just a little bit off or there's a little something off or a little wrong, the doctor will say, well, your, your baby's head is just a little large and normal. We think it's probably going to be a Down syndrome baby uh, and uh, you might want to consider the alternatives. Well, what are the alternatives? And they will then tell you that there's the option of terminating the pregnancy. And uh, you might think, well, that's a rare thing. I'm finding it's not. Deb and I were told that with one of our kids. You know, you really should think about terminating the pregnancy. And as soon as we heard that, I think they saw my face go bright. My, my face is a dead giveaway. I, I turn bright red and then kind of purplish uh, when I get angry. And I can't hide my anger. It's really a bad thing. And so they see a little steam coming out of my ears. With it, and I think they backed off. And I said, man, I don't want to hear that from you guys. Not one more time. We don't murder children. Uh, and the fra- fact of the matter is, uh, if, uh, some people are real sensitive on this one. I, 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 I'm troubled because really abortion is murder. And people say, but I had an abortion, so I'm, I'm really sensitive to this. Well, here's the good news. Um, abortion is sinful and wrong. That's just the biblical truth. That's not me. That You can find this in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say abortion is wrong. But the Bible shows that God ordains the life in the womb. And he influences the baby that's living within the womb. The Bible treats that as a person, not a fetus. So that's kind of an important thing. So doctors say you might want to consider terminating the pregnancy. And so people listen to that and they do it. Some people do it. Now, what's amazing to me is how many times people have been told that and the Christian couple say, you know what? If we have a Downs baby, praise be to the Lord. And that's a good thing. And God's got a plan and a purpose in that. And we're going to go full steam ahead. And what's amazing to me is these people that want to terminate these pregnancies, what a horrible thing because the Downs people that I know and the families that have Down babies, it's one of the greatest blessings, one of the most beautiful things that I've seen. It truly is a great, great thing. Who, who are these people that say that they, that they have the power to do that? To determine who should live and who shouldn't. We, we give medical people way too much cred. In fact, by the way, uh, the over-prescribing of medicines is something that I'm greatly concerned. And people will listen to their doctor and just take whatever they shove in their face and they'll just do it without even thinking first or minimally praying and saying, Lord, should I be taking this med? 
Now, this is where I get misquoted and letters are written all the time, uh, and I'm a little weary of it. In fact, I, I think that our radio program, which is like a year behind where we are right now, uh, a couple weeks ago talked about this issue. You know, uh, I was talking about the um, antidepressants and anxiety meds, and, and uh, I understand people get really upset when I talk about that, but it's so sad how people hear only what they want to hear. So I got a couple letters that were really uh, angry about, uh, uh, that I said, all you do is pray. Don't, don't take medicine, just pray. That's what they said I said. If you've been to Ethan Creek, is that what I said? No. What I always say is, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. So if you seek first the Lord, pray first, it's a priority. You pray first, Lord, should I be taking this medicine? Lord, should I be listening to what this doctor's telling me to do? Do I have a peace about the, the uh, diagnosis? And you see, the reason why that's important is because doctors aren't always right. How many of you guys have had actually a doctor that was wrong about you? Raise your hands. Yeah, uh, everybody, okay. Um, the thing is, uh, it happens all the time. And yet some people go into the doctor's office thinking they are God and they just kind of say, okay, I'm gonna take the med. And, and frankly, it's not just me talking about overprescribing. It's all over the news. It's secular uh, science to say, man, we gotta back way, way, way off. I was telling you guys a few years ago that they were testing the Willamette River and other rivers in America. And what they found was a real problem. Because of all the meds and stuff that people are taking, there, there's um, uh, an estrogen and stuff like that. There's, uh, because the body can't absorb all that, uh, it's eliminated through the waste system and it's poured eventually into our uh, rivers. And so our rivers have stuff in it. They find trace elements, but how trace is it? Well, what they're finding now is there's male fish in the river that are taking on female characteristics. And it's because of the uh, estrogen that's actually in the water that's making these fish go around, hey, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know, maybe. Uh, it, it makes me wonder, what in the world are we feeding our bodies? Now, don't get me wrong. There's a place for, for all that. And you got a yeah, happy fish, man. Um, I don't know. But the thing is, uh, what, what in the world are we doing? Now, now if, if, if the Lord has given you a peace in your heart, the Bible says be anxious for nothing, but, but in everything, in prayer and thanksgiving, with supplication, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God will rule your heart. Uh, man, so it, it'll be the Lord confirming, yes, this doctor's legit. He's given me this prescription. I've prayed about it. And then if you've done that, then take that med with joy and knowing that it's gonna help you, that's gonna be great. As long as God's giving you the peace and the, and the kind of the green light, the check. So I'm not anti-med. I think there's a place and a time for that. But it's not just me. It's, it's pretty much most medical people will admit, yeah, way too much of this stuff is being overprescribed. A uh, local story here in the Oregonian, kind of interesting. A woman who was prescribed 19,000 oxycodone pills in two years is suing her former Milwaukee doctor for $1.5 million, claiming she became addicted to the massive doses of painkiller and endured an excruciating withdrawal. Uh, this woman, who's now 49, suffered from chronic pain and diabetic thoracic radiculpathy. Culp? <laughs> Radiculp? You medical people. See, they think they're God. No, I'm just kidding. Just, just joke. Radiculpathy, uh, which is a compression of an, or an irritation near the spine. From 2010 to 2012, uh, the doctor per per prescribed this patient an average of 26 oxycodone pills a day, ranging from 15 milligrams to 30 milligrams. Um, attorney uh, Mark McDougall said, I'd say cases are these used to be more rare but are becoming more commonplace. The habit of overprescribing has blossomed over the years and lawsuits are starting to catch up to that. Um, this woman's suit states that the oxycodone ravaged her body. She suffered from t loss of teeth, vision, loss of vision, headaches, nausea, numbness in her hands. And when she switched doctors to a different um, um, practice, uh, she, they weaned her off the narcotic pain medication. An investigation by the Oregon Medical Board found that the doctor didn't even see Raf, this, this woman, um, or, but only spoke to her by phone during an eight month period. So he's given her all these oxycodone pills without even actually seeing her, just a phone consultation. To me, sadly, we're seeing some of that stuff go on and people wonder why people are addicted to these meds and are doctors really doing the right thing here? Be careful. 
Um, you know, uh, the great physician, God says, that's my name, Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals us. He's the great physician. Now, don't confuse me and misquote me and don't write me letters, please. I'm not the Oregon City. Some of you guys should be aware that, you know, that Oregon City Church, uh, as it's called, it's not really a church of, of the true faith, frankly, um, that says you can't take your kids to see doctors and don't take medicine and all that stuff. That's, that's not biblical either. Uh, and that's wrong. And uh, they, they've been, there's been arrests and things of these people, and there should be. It's sad. They've been very misguided, very sad. So I'm not saying I'm anti-medicine. Uh, man, I love good thing of Advil. I get headaches all the time. It's great. Uh, take a little Advil, munch it down like M&M's. Good stuff. But, <laughs> but I, I, so I'm not opposed to it. I just say, pray, seek the Lord first. And then if you feel like the Lord's giving you clearance, I'm just saying, uh, whatever he tells you to do, that's what you do. Be careful about the medical field, uh, very important. Not only that, number two, not only whatever your doctor says to you, do it. That's what our culture says. But also this one, whatever your teacher or professor says, believe it. This is where I'm really feeling like uh, we're losing the battle. We're really, really losing the battle uh, in, in America particularly, but really around the world. And that is in the academic world um, it's totally clear, and, and everybody knows that there's a, an agenda in the education world to change your kids and my kids from being Bible-believing, God-fearing people to being agnostic or atheist, uh, secular, humanistic type thinking. That they want to convert your kids, and they've very actively done this. And there's Christians that go on glibly thinking, oh, send your kids off to school. They'll still be all right. We'll teach them at home. But what they don't, what a lot of parents don't realize is how hard they're trying to teach your kids some of these things. Whatever God says to you, that's what we're to believe. And sadly, the, the teachers, the professors, those that are saying this or that or the other, and man, it gets, it gets crazy. Uh, my kids, you know, went to secular school and uh, I remember one of my kids were in uh, Tualatin High School and one of their teachers actually spent some time explaining that Christianity, Christians are the same as fundamentalist Islam. And, and uh, when the kids asked, how can you say that? Well, she said, uh, Christians blow up things just like the fundamentalist Muslims. What do you mean? Uh, they blow up abortion clinics. So they're exactly the same as the fundamentalist Muslims. Now, here's the thing. Uh, do we believe in this room, do any of us believe? Now, I just talked about abortion, by the way, and how I believe it is murder. But would I encourage anybody to ever go blow up an abortion clinic? No, that'd be sinful, wrong, and wacko. Uh, that's not a Christian behavior. So yeah, there may have been one or two crazy people over the years of this nation who did something that none of us would even call them really Christians. And yet your high school teacher is saying, it's exact, Christianity is exactly the same because they blow up abortion clinics, even though on a daily basis, there's fundamentalist Muslim blowing things up. Last week, the Hamas, fundamentalist Muslims, the Hamas sent 70 rockets over the Gaza Strip border into Israel in one day. 70 rockets. Uh, and so the Jews flew over and blew up 29 targets, defending themselves as a nation. And the world doesn't know what to do with that. Uh, the world is teaching our kids a bunch of baloney. And that's why our president says that peace-loving, fundamentalist religion of Islam, peace-loving, now, I know some Muslims here in Portland that are perhaps peace-loving, perhaps. Uh, maybe there's some peace-loving Muslims, but they're not fundamentalists. Show me a fundamentalist Christian, and I'll show you a person who's not going to blow anything up. Show me a fundamentalist Muslim in the Middle East, which I've been there five times, spent a lot of time over there, uh, and I know that uh, they would even say, man, if I could only be one to die the martyr's death. I've talked to people who say that. Uh, I've, I've met several. I've never, ever met a Christian. Not one time that ever wants to blow themselves up and women and children and stuff like that. Uh, Brett, that's just ridiculous to even say that. That's what our teachers are saying in our local school right down the road. So do we believe these guys? Well, you know, it's tough because they do teach us some things that are true, but man, your kids, hopefully they're gonna be smart enough to sort it out and say, well, if it contradicts God, then we're not gonna believe what they're saying. 
And by the way, uh, when we were starting Genesis, I spent a lot of time with the evolution issue, but it's kind of interesting. I came across this, this is a, uh, an old article that I clipped years ago, but it was kind of interesting because um, this, this comes from Dr. Colin Peterson. He's the C- senior uh, paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History in London. Um, and he was giving a, a keynote address to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. In his speech, he said this, and it shocked everybody. He said, one of the reasons I started taking the anti-evolutionary view, or let's call it the non-evolutionary view. Now, pause for a second. Uh, just, to be on his, just to make it clear, he is not a creationist and doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in any of that stuff. It's still... But he's saying, I am now a non-evolutionist. That's why he calls himself that. He doesn't want to say I'm a creationist or believe in intelligent design. He doesn't want to say all that because he's still a hardcore, ardent atheist. So he shocks everybody saying, because I've become an anti-evolutionary view or a non-evolutionary view. He says, he says, was last year I had a sudden realization that for over 20 years I thought I was working on evolution in some way. One morning I woke up and something had happened in the night and it struck me that I'd been working on this stuff for 20 years and there was not one thing I really knew about it. That's quite a shock to learn that one can be misled for so long. Either there was something wrong with me or there was something wrong with the evolutionary theory. Naturally, I know there's nothing wrong with me. (laughs) So for the last few weeks, I've been putting this simple question to various people or groups of people. He said, the question is this. Can you tell me anything you really know about evolution? Any one thing that is true? I tried that question on the geology staff at the Field Museum of Natural History, and the only answer I got was silence. I tried that question on the members of the Evolutionary Morphology Seminar at the University of Chicago, a very prestigious body of evolutionists, and all I got was silence for a long, long time. But eventually, one person stood up and said, I do know one thing, this ought not to be taught in high school. Interesting. This is a dude who's an atheist uh, scientist, spent much of his life studying, and he went to very prestigious evolutionary seminars and things. He said, man, tell me one thing we can really know for sure about evolution. Meanwhile, teachers in our local high schools are calling it fact even though it's a theory, and a harebrained one at that. See, this is where it really frustrates me, because I know there's some of you sitting out here that are what we call theistic evolutionists. And you can be that if you want to be dumb. (laughs) Oh, but Brett, I'm smarter than you. Maybe, but here's the thing. I just think, what a farce, man, to believe that something came from nothing. Yeah, but Brett, you believe in a, a God that created... Yeah, listen, here's what I believe. I believe that God pre-existed, that he, in the beginning, God, we just assume he existed because he's all eternal, the Bible teaches. So then it says, God created the heavens and the earth. So we believe God created something from nothing and spoke it into existence. Oh, fantasy. Okay, but think about what you believe. You believe that nothing, in the beginning, nothing created something from nothing. Which one's worse? You believe that nothing came from, something came from nothing. That's crazy. That, that's just fantasy. Man, you got more faith than I have a hundred times over. To believe in that, you got to be like, woo, faith. Man, that's crazy. To believe that this intricacy, uh, this, uh, you know, your polynucleotide strands, your D, D, DNA, and the structure that's there, it all just kind of happened by a Accidental sense of circumstances, and it went from goo, the primordial soup, from goo to you. That's just faith, man. You are crazy faith. See, I hope you guys that are theistic evolutionists, as they're called, man, I want to challenge. Even the secular dudes are jumping off the evolution ship, as they should. I love that. What was that show, the movie, um, where that, um, you know, the uh, Bueller, that guy, um, yeah, that dude. Um, he, he, uh, he did that movie uh, uh, where, oh, Expelled. Uh, and it was, it was in the theaters, but he was basically showing how the evolutionists are shutting down anybody who has any other theories, intelligent design or whatever. It wasn't a creation movie per se, but it was this guy just saying, why is the science so hostile toward those who believe in intelligent design? 
and he, uh, and he um, interviewed this one notable evolutionist and, um, and he, he got him into this place that was really awkward where, well, you know, um, he asked the question and the guy said, well, what are the alternatives, uh, you know, I mean, if evolution weren't there? And he said, he said well, um, space aliens came and planted life. And, and it, the way he said it was just kind of cuckoo, cocoa nuts kind of thing. You know what I mean? He was like, Ooh, he said it. And I was like, yep, that pretty much sums it up. Uh, one lady who was interviewed, a uh, professor of a university, I think it was Harvard, um, to, to explain wh- why you should believe in evolution, says you have to have just really a really great imagination. It's like, yes, you do. It's like taking a bucket of bolts and aluminum and um, you know rivets and leather and carpet and just put in a big old box, huge box the size of an airplane hanger. Just fill it full of parts, airplane parts. And then just shake it up. Shake it up real hard. And you shake it, how long would it take for you to shake that? And after shaking it, how long would it take for you to shake it and it actually fall into place and become a Boeing 777? Since we're missing one right now. Anyway, (laughs) let's shake up a building. You say, Brett, that's ridiculous. Well, do you know that the intricacy of a 777 is pretty impressive, but it's nothing compared to your body. And what evolutionists are trying to say is you, this is why they say billions and billions of years because they say it has, you you got shaken up and you just sort of evolved after billions of years and it it went from nothing pile of uh, elements to you. Not in a billion years. So our teachers are teaching us and they're teaching us not just evolution, but all kinds of things. They're teaching safe sex, so-called. Like there really is such a thing. It's amazing to me. I could go on on that one, but I better not. So you've got the world saying, doctors, do what the doctors say. Whatsoever your doctor says, do it. Whatsoever your teacher or professor says, do it. Or how about this one? Whatever your culture says, do it. Every culture, I think, has a blind spot where they don't really know the right thing. And other cultures look from the outside and go, man, stretching their necks out, making those girls wear those things that make your neck like three feet long. Is that a good idea? And the guys there think that's really sexy, I guess. That giraffe neck thing. Woo. <laughs> and we gotta look into that culture. Now, some of you I'm sure are like, oh, that's just such a beautiful thing. I'm sure the girl that's got the neck stretching out, she's not thinking it's beautiful. So it sounds hurt, painful to me. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, in Vanuatu, they got a cultural thing where they we, we, you know, we do missionary work there and I've been there a couple times and they, they're the guys you see on National Geographic. They climb those bamboo towers that are 120 feet tall and they tie a vine to their leg, one vine. Uh, and, uh, and they stand up there and they clap to the gods like this and they uh, do this worship thing and then they jump off this tower. And the goal is to hit your head on the ground, but not so hard that you die. Only hard enough that your hair kind of hits the ground and if your hair hits the ground, uh, then you're going to have fertile crops that year because the gods saw your jump and they, they thought you were real proud of you. I climbed up on one of those towers. You know, those little pygmy guys, they weigh like a buck 20. So I'm up there and they're all looking at me going, ah! and they're, they're little bamboo things like, ah! it's like uh, but I thought, man, you couldn't pay me a million dollars to jump off that with a vine I tied to my foot. These native guys try, they do it from the time they're little boys. They start from like three feet high and then they just keep going up and up. By the time they're older men, they jump from 120 feet. I met a guy that it was the, the Vanuatu record holder of jumping off a bamboo tower from 125 feet up. And he lived to tell about it. Um, one white guy tried it and he died. <clears throat> That's sad. Uh, but you know, you think that's a cultural thing. I, I, I don't wanna do that necessarily. What, what is America's blind spot culturally? Uh, you know, and, and um, I think probably one of the best things is maybe to ask somebody who's not an American. There's a term for Americans that travel around the world. Does anybody know what it is? it's called? Ugly American. Hmm, what's our blind spot? Could it be pride? See, I've asked Europeans, why do they call us ugly Americans? Well, it's because of the way you carry yourselves. Um, well, how can you even tell I'm an American? So you go to Spain, you get a mullet cut and wear loafers and dress really nice and, and just act a little bit frilly. Uh, why don't I stand out? They're like, just the way you carry yourselves. 
I'm joking. I actually went to Spain. I kind of was cracking up. The kids all had mullets, and uh, and uh, it was just kind of a different culture. I was like, okay, that's fine. But they, I could tell they kind of didn't like me. And it's because, well, you're an American. I was with a buddy. Maybe some of you guys remember Nick Finelli. He was here for years, great guy. Nick and I and Tad went into this store. Nick, who was fluent in Spanish, uh, um, but he... He looked like us, the Americans, and we walk in the, the store, and these three guys behind the, the, the little Spanish dudes, you know, um, they were standing behind the counter, and they were, they, were, they were just talking amongst themselves, and they said, look at these stupid Americans. They were saying all the stuff about us, thinking that we didn't know Spanish, which we didn't. Fortunately, Nick did. Um, but Nick uh, heard them just totally insulting us, these big Americans and blah, 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 ugly Americans. And, um, and then Nick just went up and said, man, why are you so unkind to my friends? And he said it in perfect Spanish. The, and, then, and, and when I heard Nick say that, I thought, oh, they must have been saying something bad. So I turned and kind of went like this and looked at him. <laughs> like I understood, you know. <laughs> Mucho comprendo. <laughs> and man, they got all nervous and uh, were a little quivery back there, little Spanish quivery dudes. But Brett, you're insulting the Spain people. Well, uh, <laughs> okay, the Spanish, I know. Um, <laughs> The little Spain dudes. Um, uh, yeah, I, I didn't have fun there, but they, they pretty much would explain to us that, well, it's just that ugly American. What is it about us? I think it's the way we carry ourselves, and, and uh, it oftentimes tends to be a prideful kind of arrogant sort of attitude. That's the truth of the matter. And we sing, I'm proud to be an American. Is that a good thing? Should we be singing, I'm prideful about being American? I don't know. I, I, I'm a patriot. I love this country, but man... Um, I, I wonder sometimes if our culture is just a little bit too haughty. We could talk about our little blind spots as Americans, uh, materialism, wealthiest people around the world, and we don't even know it, and we sit around and complain. The world just looks in and says, man, what's up with you guys? I wonder what our cultural world is saying. Do this. Whatsoever your culture tells you to do, just do it. And we buy it. Hook, line, and sinker. Even though the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. We talk about to our children, self-esteem. And we build up a child's self-esteem so much that they uh, might think that more highly of themselves than they really should. I think parents do this sometimes. We, as Americans, we teach our kids how wonderful they are and pretty much so that they have no humility and they don't really have an honest evaluation of their skill set. Have you ever met a person that just totally doesn't get that they don't really have a skill set that's going to really fit the job description? Does American Idol tell us anything? <laughs> I'm a singer. Okay, let's hear you. Ah! No, you're not. Yes, I am. And they get all mad and stuff. I mean, are there blind spots? It's the self-esteem movement where the Bible says that we are to esteem others better than ourselves. That's whatsoever God tells you to do. That's what we're supposed to do. See what I'm saying? Culturally, we've been fed a bill of goods on a lot of topics, and we need to be careful. So we are Americans, but we should be, before we're Americans, we should be Christians who believe in the Bible. And whatever God tells you to do, do it. So you got doctors telling you what to do. You got, you know, culture telling you what to do. You got your teachers and profs telling you what to believe. What about this? You've got what people saying, whatsoever your feelings. <laughs> whatsoever your feelings are telling you to do. You have to say it like that, Feelings. Can I just give you quick advice? Don't. Go with your heart. Just follow your heart. You have to say it with a quiver in your voice. Heart. <laughs> follow your heart. Don't. Jeremiah 17, 9. Your heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. That's what the Bible says. Uh, I think it's one of the goofiest things in the world is follow your heart. Because my heart uh, will mislead me. Now, there is a difference, by the way. Some of you are going to come and say, but what if uh, the Lord puts something on your heart? Well, there is a difference between the person who uh, actually is a regenerated heart. In fact, uh, the prophet said uh, that I will take your stony hard heart and I will replace it with a heart of flesh and soften your heart. So there is a, a difference between the person who's been saved and accepted Christ and believes in the Lord and the Lord starts to direct the heart. Even as we talked about earlier, the peace of God will rule your heart is said there in Philippians 4. So there is a place where your heart can be helpful, but ultimately you gotta be very skeptical of your heart. 
Some of you followed your heart when you were younger and it misled you and you were finding yourself in trouble. Amen? Be careful, especially you younger people who follow your heart. Don't. Follow your mom and dad. But maybe better than that, follow the Bible and do what the Bible tells you to do, what God tells you to do. That's what you do. So follow your feelings? No. Culture? No. Uh, Follow the doctor or the teacher or the professor? Be careful. Now, I'm not saying all that's bad. I'm just saying first we follow God before these things. Also, uh, number five on the consideration, whatsoever everybody else is doing, do that. It's funny how we follow the crowd. All we like sheep have gone astray. Did you know uh, I used to raise sheep in 4-H when I was a little kid? And sheep are cute and cuddly, but they're really dumb. You can scare sheep with a mouse. There, there's been sheep that have been so frightened, they just turned, all of them turned and ran off a cliff and died. That's what sheep do. Um, all we like sheep have gone astray. It's interesting that um, there's a uh, psychological condition that they call group numbing. It's kind of a sad story, and I'm not talking about the politics of Vietnam. It was a sad, horrible conflict back when I was a little kid. But um, one of the things that made it more notorious as a conflict was Mei Lai. Mei Lai was a village where uh, our soldiers went in and killed men, women, and children. And so our nation freaked out and called all the soldiers who were actually heroes, but they were called baby killers. Remember that? Some of you are old enough to remember all that. Hanoi Jane. Shane Fonda went over to North Vietnam and sat on the tanks, and uh, it was just kind of a crazy, messed up, tweaked out deal. Well, what was interesting, and not arguing the, all that, a uh, sad situation, but after the soldiers that were part of the May Lai thing, they came and interviewed them and said, man, what gets into a person to shoot women and children? Well, you got to remember, the, the people that weren't there, there were women that were shooting other people. I mean, there were the hostiles, children with bombs. I mean, it was a hard thing to discern. But they said, here's the main thing when we were there is, man, when we saw the other soldiers shooting people, we thought that's what we're supposed to do. And there was this group numbing effect because everybody in the group started doing it, everybody did it and wiped out a whole village and thought that that's what they were supposed to do. And uh, it's, it's interesting because as people, oftentimes because the crowd is doing something, it must be okay. Even within the church, behavior of Christians, well, if all the other Christians are doing this stuff, watching those movies, listening to that music, going to those places. If everybody else says it's okay, blow off whatever God says and do what everybody else is doing. And I believe that God has called us to go against the flow. If you're going so easily with the flow, you might be going the wrong way. Just something to think about. If life is really easy and you're just flowing along with everybody else, is there ever a time where you feel uncomfortable and you're the one person who's not gonna do what everybody else is doing? Have you ever found yourself in that situation? Hey, let's go see a movie. What movie do you want to see? Oh, we're going to go see such and such movie. Have you ever been in the one where you're like, "Uh, I'm not going to go to that one? Why? Well, I've kind of made, there's a certain standard that I have of just not putting any unclean thing before my eyes like the Bible says. Oh, the Bible. Have you ever found yourself in the Holy Joe position where people think you're a self-righteous blah, blah, blah? Or have you been so going with the flow that that's never come up in your life? Chances are there might be some reconsiderations. See, any dead fish can go with the flow. But the the person who's the, the one who's truly saved will from time to time find themselves swimming up current. Jesus said this, all who live godly will suffer persecution. How much persecution have you suffered for your holy walk, for being different, for rather than whatever everybody else is doing, you're doing whatever God calls you to do? How many of us have been in that place? Number, what are we on, six? Whatever your doctor, whatever your professor, teacher, whatever your culture, whatever your feelings, whatever everybody else is doing. But here's the last one. Whatever your pastor says unto you, do it. Brett, is that a positive thing you're saying? Or is that, are you, what, what are you saying? I'm just saying, don't. Don't do whatever your pastor tells you to do. Now, you say, Brett, that's kind of self-defeating. We should just get up and leave then, right? Well, here's the thing. I have found that uh, it's really interesting. We're living in a day where the pastors are saying stuff that's not even in this book. 
Uh, I'm shocked. Remember all these books that have been written over the years? I'm always kind of shocked at the bandwagon books. I call them bandwagon books where everybody's like, oh, it's the most amazing book that was written. No, the Bible's the most amazing book that was written. No, but it, it just really relates to me. The Bible relates to you. Oh, but it's called The Shack, and it's so wonderful. Some of you guys loved it. You thought The Shack was good, even though it was really, really bad. And it really, oh, but Brett, you don't understand. No, I, I've read The Shack, and I understand some of you had all teary-eyed and saw the grace of God and all that stuff. And, but I'm just telling you, it's messed up biblically. It was just a messed up biblically, but it got all this notoriety and churches, instead of studying the Bible on Sunday morning, churches started studying the shack. Uh, is that a good idea? In fact, even if it's a good book, do we really want to, I mean, <clears throat> when I read the Bible, what I find is a book that's so amazing that we could study this book for the next 5,000 years and never run out of stuff to think about, pray through, change, alter, adjust. I mean, this thing's loaded. And it, what's amazing, it's God's word to humanity. It's inspired. It's God breathed, as the Bible says. And we can study this book, but instead people are studying 40 days of purpose. And they went through 40 sermons, 40 weeks, when you could have just gone through the Bible. To me, that's just a sorry exchange. I'm sorry. It should, it, it just, you can like that book if you want, but I'm just saying the Bible, it's God's word. And the problem with man's word is we can mess it up. So you got to take your pastor's word and say, okay, wait, is what Brett's saying truly biblical? Is it really what the Bible says? <clears throat> and and you, it's your job to, to sort that out. <clears throat> and so like in Acts chapter 17, I like to read it often here. And I tell you this a lot, but here's the model um, in Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> so Paul and Silas, they go to Berea. <clears throat> <clears throat> and they went into the synagogue of the Jews and started teaching. And it says here in Acts 17, 11, and these men in Th were more noble, the men of Berea, were more noble than that of Thessalonica. And when they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so, therefore many of them believed and also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. What's that? It's saying that they did two things. I love this. They received the word from Paul and Silas with readiness of mind. Now listen, this is the thing. Some people say, well, you're a pastor, Brett, so I'm not gonna listen to you. You're right, Brett, I'm not gonna listen to you. You're evil. Well, that's all true, but you shouldn't not listen to me. And I'll tell you why. The Bible tells us that in the church, there should be pastors and teachers. That's, that's what the Bible says. Um, and so you got your pastors, you got your teachers, but you listen to them, not with a critical ear. See, that's where some people get it really wacky. They hear what I'm saying. They're like, okay, Brett, I'm gonna listen to you. I had a couple, they, they came to our church for a few weeks, had lunch with them because they wanted to, well, this is what they said. We wanna interview you. Oh, really? You have a job? It's like, no, we're gonna interview you and see if the church is going to be uh, good for us. I was like, okay, I'll take the interview. And so we went uh, to Applebee's and had lunch and they interviewed me. What do you feel about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about that? And um, and I think I answered all their questions correctly because that's what I believed. And so then they came up to me the next Sunday. Uh, we've prayed about it, they said, and we have chosen to let Athey Creek be our home church, but we will tell you something. I said, what's that? They said, we will watch you. <laughs> and if you say anything wrong or incorrect, we, we will come and correct you. I said, well, you're gonna be busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I, 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 they scared me so much, I was kind of hoping they wouldn't go to our church, you know what I mean? Um, but they did. And um, uh, they ended up kind of being nice people and then they moved away, uh, thank the Lord. But all that to say, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I, this isn't a license just to be a jerk to your pastor. I'm not saying that. If you move away from here and say, oh, I'm gonna listen to you. And that's not these guys. You missed the first part. The first part says when Paul and Silas preached the word, what did they do? They received it with what? Readiness of mind. Don't you love it? There are notebooks. I love Athey Creek because you guys come with Bibles in hand, your notebooks, and you're there ready to receive the word. I love that. But I also love that, and, and I trust, and I hope and pray that you'll go home and say, now, we received the word and we heard the teaching. Now let's just make sure and search the scriptures to see if what Brett was saying is true. The re you say, Brett, aren't, don't you trust yourself a little bit? Well, it, it, better men than me have taught bad things. I don't even agree with myself sometimes. You know what I'm saying? It's like uh, I listened to my old teachings from 20 years ago. I'm like, woo, man. 
can you guys remove that one off our database? Uh, you know, it's like that we're, we're, we're goofy people, but we're still, now this is where it gets kind of tough. People that were once evangelical pastors that everybody knows and loves of big churches and stuff, just because they have a big church and lots of people, that almost means you should even be more careful because everybody comes piling in like, oh, we love you. We think you're an amazing pastor. And there's this rock star mentality that's in churches today. I don't believe Paul and Silas were rock stars. Um, I believe when they came, people were like, I don't know about these guys, man. Paul had a short, little bald-headed, big hooked nose, the Bible tells us. In fact, history tells us he had a squeaky voice. He was very unappealing. He had these eyes that tended to water all the time. He was always like, had this weepy eye syndrome. So he's a short, bald, squeaky voice and talking to me like this. And, and people were like, I don't know about this guy. But he preached the word and the people received it as it was. And they said, okay, this is the word. And they were blessed. But sadly, you'll find pastors today teaching stuff that's just ever so subtle. Rob Bell is a pastor. Everybody thought was awesome, wrote the books. Everybody got on the bandwagon of his book, Love Wins. Which means basically he was saying everybody ends up in heaven. That's not what the Bible says because there's a lot of people and broad is the path that leads to destruction. And the Bible talks about a place called Gehenna in the Greek or hell, a place of lake of fire where there's burning and Satan and his demons will be thrown there and all those who've rejected the son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is a literal hell, but it sounds so good. He's such a nice guy. And he said, nobody's really gonna end up in hell. That's a false teaching. And people bought it, hook, line, and sinker. And so good pastors who once taught from the Bible are starting to sneak stuff in. You got to, you know, there's pastors that talk about henotheism, that there's many gods really. Watch out for that teaching. That's, you know, in, in the early days, there were, that, that was called heresy teaching. So you don't, want, you don't want to believe in many gods. We believe in one God, one true God. There's many false gods. We'll call them false gods, but they're not true gods. People are teaching that. Open theism, where God doesn't know the beginning from the end. God doesn't know the future. Does God know the future? Even the minimalist Bible student can say, well, God kind of knows what's going to happen in the future. But that's a big teaching out there, open theism. And people that were once good pastors are now starting to say, kind of like this theology. You got to search the scriptures and see if what the Bible is. Good pastors who are on TV that, that you watch and love are teaching that there's actually, uh, God is really three gods there's a separate between the spirit, the father, and the son, and they're kind of separate. And depending on what you want to call it, modalism or whatever, the early church, they called that heresy and they'd kick those people out of the church and say, you are teaching wrong. Today, we put him on TV and because he's got a fancy suit and he sweats a lot and yells as he marches across the stage, everyone's like, yeah, amen, brother. Don't just take your pastor's word for it. It's the word of God. That's why I love that you guys have Bible in hand. So with all that said, what else? Maybe it's good for you to pray, Lord, are there voices that I listen to? Here's Rachel and Leah giving the one bit of good advice we can cling to. Whatsoever God tells you to do, do it. And be careful with all the other voices. Sort them out and say, does this line up with what God has told me to do? I know it's a simple teaching, but it's easier said than done. So may you have wisdom to do what the Bible says, to follow his word. Amen? Yes. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We find in your word stability and safety, blessing, Lord. We find that your word withstands the test of time. There's no fads or fashions that we can jump on, bandwagons that become popularized that we jump on. But Lord, instead, we, we realize that your word is steadfast, immovable, and unshakable. I pray, Lord, that we would be a church who are like the Bereans, who search the scriptures daily, first receiving your word from the pastor uh, with all readiness of mind to receive, but then secondly, searching the scripture to see if it was true. Lord, I pray that your word would be confirmed in our hearts. On the non-essential issues, we agree to love one another. And even if we disagree on those things, we know it's okay. But on the essential doctrines of the Christian faith, Lord, help us to be unified and speaking truth from your word. Bless Athey Creek, Lord, as we go our way. I pray for anybody who might have heard this sermon, uh, who has listened to the world and has taken the advice, but not really received the truth of the gospel. 
I pray that they would realize like we all are sinners, the wages of sin is death, Lord, that they would know that you are the answer. You're the way, the truth, the life, the one who forgives us for our sins. But for that to happen, Lord, I I know there needs to be that salvation, the saving work of the cross applied. So save souls, Lord. I pray that people would hear this message and be drawn to your word and, and be saved. So we pray, Lord, that you'd help them. Bless us as we go our way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. And if you're not a Christian and you'd like to become a Christian, man, it's the way. It's not that your life's going to be perfect or rosy, but you're forgiven for your sins. You have heaven to look forward to. Hell is real. But the way to avoid that, to get away from that altogether is through Jesus. If you'd like to do that, a couple of my pastors are gonna be back by the back stairs back there. They'll pray with you and send you on your way. They won't sign you up for anything or take blood or get your email address or any of that stuff. And if you ever notice everybody wants, you go to Radio Shack to buy a battery and they're like, okay, what's your email address? What's your blood type? What's... Nah, that's dumb. We won't do that, but we'll pray with you and you can be saved. So do that. Other than that, say hi to some people. Feel free to stick around and hang out. God bless you. You're dismissed.